it is Sunday, but we are not done yet. Are you guys having a good time? It's Robert Inglis! You're all my children now. Welcome. Thank you. Have a seat, have a seat. Okay. Um, you guys, I know you guys have a ton of questions for Robert. I have a ton of questions for him too, because I'm such a fan. So go ahead, line up to the mics, and while people get themselves sorted, Robert, what, how are you a big fanboy too, of a lot of different shows? I'm the old fart fanboy of the universe. You are not old, yeah. let's just start there. But what, what are you binge watching right now? What, what are you well, into? Well, you know, I, I don't know, are you guys, have you guys discovered Legion? As far as I'm concerned, they've really upped the ante now on uh, on superheroes. It's just, I think it's an extraordinary show. Last night, I snuck across the street and I saw Get Out. So if you're a horror fan, trust me on this one and trust me on Split. As in, as in Split personality. And you will recognize, I didn't even recognize McAvoy. You know, until halfway through the movie, and I'm, you know, I dent a star. So I've been, and also, you know, this is a little more, uh, it's been around a while, but for many of you, if you haven't uh, caught up and binged on Penny Dreadful, Woo! there's some great stuff. Yeah. And the new one I found, and I'm not sure what it means, I'm not sure how to classify it, what genre to put it in, but uh, I was really hypnotized by OA. <laughs> Oh, wow. I, well, I don't want to, we can't spoiler alert, you see. I don't want to spoiler alert the ending. I actually didn't expect that at all, but I did not dislike it. And my leading lady from Last Showing, which was my movie that's out now uh, on DVD and stuff, it's some of the best work I've done, but Emily Barrington now is kicking it as the lead synth robot girl on uh, Humans. And she's my favorite robot girl uh, uh, since uh, Ex Machina. Although, I don't know, Scarlett Johansson's on deck, I think. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, there's just such great stuff to find out there. Uh, you know, you can burrow deep onto Netflix, and I'm not plugging Netflix, but on demand. I've been finding a lot of stuff. Sometimes on Fridays, when they change the, the, the movies on on demand, I'll sit down with a tuna sandwich, and I'll click on the, the movies and then go to the movie section and you know, and on demand it breaks down and you can go to the new horror movies. Well, the trailers are free, so I'll watch the trailers and every once in a while on, on, on the horror section or the new movies or even in the foreign section by watching the trailers, you find something you've never heard about. Something yeah. that slipped through the cracks and just hasn't had the hype and you can find some extraordinary stuff there. But anyway, that's sort of what I've been up to. I've got a couple of movies coming out. I just finished a movie with Lynn Shea from Insidious. Woo! You guys, she's the teacher in the original Nightmare on Elm Street. She's, uh, you know, the floppy boobies in Something About Mary. She's been in a million movies. She's great in this movie. It's called The Midnight Man. And it's one of those horror movies about the game you should not play when you're a child. And I had great success with one called Urban Legend. And you guys all know Ouija, there's a lot of them, but it's a sort of subset genre of the horror flicks. So look for Midnight Man. I just worked with Jason London in a film over in Eastern Europe where I play a contemporary, blind, old Van Helsing character who's Ooh. brought out of retirement because one of the seven worldly portals to purgatory, the seal has been broken. And I'm the only one that knows how to fix it. It's called Night World. And we don't want the Night World people in our world. Uh, but those are the new horror movies I have coming out. Got a bunch of games coming out. Masters of Orion. And one that I'm not allowed to talk about. Uh, but let's just say it's, it's uh, not the Marvel Universe. It's the other one. Ooh. So do we want to do Q&A? I think so. I mean, okay. your face got a lot of questions. We have some people lined up. I'm ready. Ask me anything. Well, you don't want to say that, Robert, because right. you know, that really opens it up. Oh, I, come on. I mean, it's, 
Yeah, you see how the kids are gonna get nasty? All right. <laughs> Why don't we start over here? Hi. 12 or 15 movies, and I had this hit miniseries. Remember, now miniseries are back again, which is great, because I think they really help us with our attention spans being stretched. Um, but I was dealing with my first bout of celebrity and fame, and V was international. And when I fit Freddie into the schedule, and went to do it. I had some reservations, but I really wanted to work with Wes Craven. And I remember once, I probably was a week or so into it, and you know, you can kind of hide in that makeup. And television acting, a lot of television acting is very behavioral acting, very reactive. And there's a little voice in your head, and actors don't like to admit this, but there's always a little voice in your head going, don't act, don't act, don't get caught acting. And that, that can kind of drive you crazy too, because we do know how to act, and, and, and a lot of us have the courage to perform. And there's, a, there's an actor at this convention that I idolize. I'm a fanboy too, Vincent D'Onofrio. This is a man that's not afraid. Now, you know, this is a man that's a brave, brave uh, uh, artist. And, uh, uh, and, and so there was this moment when I was doing Nightmare Not Sweet One, where I got very liberated by being hidden in the makeup and working in front of exaggerated scenery or surrounded by green screen effects. And I remember I was able to call upon all these tricks that I knew from my days in the theater. And uh, I could change my voice, and I could change the way I move. I remember one day walking in front of the mirror and that glove, the original glove was quite heavy. And instead of standing like this, I started standing like Jimmy Cagney. The old Jimmy Cagney, the old gangster actor, you dirty rat, na 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 And by the end of the day, I was standing like this because of the weight of the claw. And I saw myself in the mirror and I said, what does that remind me of? I realized, like a gunfighter, like the, with a low holster on my leg ready to pull out the thing because I'm so I exaggerated that stance. Instead of just being like this, I really dropped the shoulder as Freddie. And then I could fling the, the blades out perpendicular. And I found that. And that's something that I wouldn't have done as a in a normal role or a behavioral role or a TV talking heads performance. But Freddie opened that door for me. And and so the great gift that Freddie gave me Back then is when I finally got done with Freddie and the other makeup roles, Phantom of the Opera, Stephen King's The Mangler, and some others. By the time I came out of the makeup and everything, I was actually a better actor because I, I was not afraid to go to those places anymore where I would make those kind of acting choices. Um, and, and it was just very liberating to play Freddie in that first movie, to, to work in a different voice and to work differently physically. So I think that was sort of like the fun part and the gift of playing Freddy. Now, when I, or at the end when I was playing Freddy, I, I doubted the fact that I was scary anymore. So I would hide backstage in the wings of the soundstage behind the scenery, and I'd wait for some 200 pound grip and a tool belt to go back for some cocktail weenies and a cup of Starbucks. And I'd just step out from behind the scenery and I'd go, gotcha, just to see if I still had it. Needless to say, those young grips never wore their underwear again. <laughs> Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Alex. I live in Boise right now, but I'm from, I guess, born in the Crypt Keeper and, uh, and many other classic uh, 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 special effects makeups. But he used to bring in prototypes of Chucky early Chucky, and Chucky originally, he always had the big overalls, but he was like hip hop. He was like, he had a baseball hat on sideways for a while, and he was and he was heavier. And then they slimmed him down, and they gave him the long hair and the freckles. But I used to see all these incarnations of Chucky. Chuck would bring them in and have my, get my opinion on them. But I, I, no, I don't want to fight uh, Chucky. I don't know, you know, I am very disappointed. We left some money on the table, as they say in Hollywood. Right after the great success of Freddy vs. Jason, uh, Sam Raimi was the king of the world. Uh, he had more money than God because of the great Spider-Man, the first Spider-Man movie. And uh, I'm a huge fan of Sam's, and I'm a 
big fan of, of Bruce Campbell. And, uh, and they, had, they had this idea of Freddy versus Jason versus Ash. Now, now that we've all, now we're in what we call post Deadpool, post Guardians of the Galaxy uh, perception. But back then we hadn't had that kind of a film yet, with the exception of Evil Dead and Freddy vs. Jason, that were really mashing graphic novel and comedy and horror and science fiction. So I love this idea that they wanted, or Sam Raimi wanted, Bruce Campbell, Ash, to win. He wanted him to win the match which I thought was a great idea. New Line Cinema was against it because I had just had my ass kicked by Jason. They were afraid, because I was the most successful of the three franchises, they were, they were afraid that we can't have Freddy killed twice in a row. And I was like, wait a minute, you guys. You revived me, you resurrected me with dog urine. You know? <laughs> it's real easy to bring Freddy back. Come on, that's not that hard to do in writing. But anyway, uh, and, and I love the idea. I, I had this vision of the poster. Bruce Campbell, you know, who, 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 who wasn't a, a, a youngster anymore at this point, uh, but Bruce with his shirt open and uh, all of his abs, uh, you know, uh, spray painted and highlighted like one of the, one of the 300, you know, <laughs> and with, with Freddy Krueger under this arm and Jason under this arm, and the poster would say, Freddy versus Jason versus Ash, keeping the world safe from sequels. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I'm oh, my little Freddyette. Have you seen the new action figure? There's a Japanese anime girl named Bijou. It's a three foot action figure of her in, in the Freddy drag. It's really sexy. She prefers cut off jeans. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here. I'm Kelly. I'm from Tacoma. And uh, you kind of touched it on this a little bit, but I'm hoping you can settle an argument that has plagued my marriage since 2003, when Freddy and J versus Jason came out, and my husband and I went to go see it, and at the end, you know, he says, well, obviously Jason won, because Freddy is a sober hood. And I say, well, they're obviously in the dream world, because he winks at the camera. So that means Freddy won. Who won? It's real simple. Jason takes a nap, I've got him. <laughs> Thank you. That's what the wink, that's what the wink meant. I hope that settles the, uh, the question in your marriage. <laughs> it did. Good. The right way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm Brian from Vancouver. <laughs> really people. So, you spent so many years of your career getting into makeup. What was your major pastime while they just sat there and applied everything to you? Oh God, I, I we used to watch like the morning talk shows. First, first it was heavy metal because you know I worked for many years with uh, the K and B boys, and uh, N in K and B of course is Greg Nicotero, Walking Dead. The K is Robert Kurtzman, Wishmaster. Uh, the B is Howard Berger. Uh, and, and oh, who's got the Oscar for Chronicles of Narnia, and of course they do all the Quentin Tarantino and all the Robert Rodriguez movies. Great effects guys. But when I first was with those guys, getting you know uh, the chest of souls, you know, stapled to my nipples or whatever else they were doing to me, uh, it was all heavy metal. Those guys had had their, and so I, I became a reluctant heavy metal fan. Uh, and then I, I, we met. We used to. We got fancy enough to get little TVs in the makeup room. And we'd watch a lot of the morning talk shows, you know. But I can't complain. I mean, I would love, you know, to be a whiny guy and tell you how horrible the makeup is. Oh, please take care of me and give me a foot massage. Oh, the makeup. But I got drunk in a pub in, uh, in outside of London with one of the orcs from Lord of the Rings once. <laughs> in fact, he was the lead orc, the general orc. If those guys had to be camera ready at 9 in the morning, they had a 2 a.m. call. Now, that's more, that's more macho than, God rest his soul, John Hurt in The Elephant Man, yep. or Tim Curry in Legend, was it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, which were, were extraordinary makeups. Um, so those are really the rough, rough makeups. There's, there's a lot more that are hard for me. I did a movie called The Mangler, a Stephen King movie. Uh, and I sort of 
stole from an old Orson Welles movie called Lady from Shanghai, my character with leg braces and the way I looked. And uh, that was rough because it was a combination of stretching my skin, letting it snap back in age and hitting it with hair dryers, and then the prosthetics, the brow, the nose, the hair, the waddles under the chin, which I don't need makeup for anymore. <laughs> but uh, no, that was a rough one. And I did, a, I did a Phantom of the Opera, which was makeup over makeup. Woo! So we did a kind of handsome Robert England makeup with molds. And I, so I looked sort of like one of those uh, cheesy busts of Beethoven with the long flowing white hair. And then underneath that, it was my disfigured phantom face on one side. And because we never knew what scenes we were doing, we had to put it all on every day because sometimes I would be uh, decomposing. And uh, sometimes I would look my best because I would be at the opera, my beloved opera, watching uh, Christine sing for me. That was a rough one too because both of those also involved lots of hair. Freddie doesn't have any hair, so I get to wear a bald paint. But uh, those were those were rough makeups. I think Phantom Phantom's four four and a half hours camera ready, so that was a long day. They get me in that makeup, they don't let me out of it. I've worked around the clock on on each of those movies. I've worked 24 hours as Freddie and 24 hours as the Phantom and 24 hours uh, in uh, the Mangler, the Stephen King film. So yeah, makeup's tricky. But I'm, I, again, I'm not the, I'm not the martyr. There's other other uh, performers and other projects that you guys know that are rougher. I I don't even know how long Ron. I wonder how long Ron Perlman takes for Hellboy. Oh. That's pretty extensive too. It is. Thank you for that question. And 24 hours filming that. I mean, that's a that's a. Well, they save money by leaving yeah. the make, even though they have to pay me. You know, they have to pay us after the a overtime. certain amount of time overtime. They're still saving money because they don't have to bring me back the next day. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Hi. Hello. I am Evan. I am from. Vancouver, Washington, and my I've guest. got family in Vancouver, Washington, with okay. the same last name. Yeah, it's right across the river from Portland, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. And my question for you is, what was your favorite special effect in the first Nightmare on Elm Street? Oh, I was on the set the day we killed Johnny Depp. <laughs> We borrowed this idea from Stanley Kubrick's movie, The Shining. And you know The Shining, when the elevator bleeds, the elevator that bleeds, well, that elevator's upside down, and the camera's right side up. So that's how, the, and so gravity makes that work. It, it, it looks like it's happening, but it's not. So when, when the blood shoots up from Johnny Depp's bed, it's really an upside down room. In fact, it was the same room I killed Tina in. Same room I dragged her across the ceiling in. We just put all of Johnny Depp's cool boy stuff in there instead of Tina's bad girl stuff. So I want to see this effect because he's got, it's the first one they did that we hadn't done Tina yet. Uh, and uh, I wanted to see how the revolve worked. It was a giant room on a gimbal which spun like a Ferris wheel. And our crew had been working night and day for weeks on this room. And they had it all loaded, they had all the blood loaded in the ceiling, they had it all ready to go. They had two Volkswagen uh, uh, bucket seats in there with two cameras for the cameraman and the director. And they were gonna, they were all, got it all ready, got it all loaded up. The bed's gonna explode with Johnny Depp's guts. And they spin the room and they spun it the wrong way. <laughs> they spun it the wrong way so when the blood came in the room, it hit one of the walls, weighted it, made it spin faster, and then the blood rushed out of Johnny Depp's window. So I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm picking off the Freddy makeup, you know, and I'm watching it, and I've got my arm around Heather, and she's in her little shorty nightgown, and I'm kind of digging it, and I'm looking at this, and I'm watching the Ferris wheel dimbled room go, and all of a sudden, out of one of the windows comes a tidal wave of blood. And it comes, it's like a six inch wave coming at me across the floor. Now the floor of a sound stage is all cable and electrical plugs plugged into each other. And I'm going, well, I wasn't really that good in science, but water, blood, electricity, I'm out of here. <laughs> and we, Heather and I just ran out into the alley. We were at the old Desi Lou studio. I love Lucy. Freddie meets Lucy. That's a, that's a <laughs> name. So that was kind of my favorite effect. Um, later on, we did a, a, a scene in a water bed in, in part three, 
And we all, you know, and I'm in the waterbed, you know, and, and I have to hold my breath, and we're setting it up, and there's the naked girl that comes up in the waterbed, you know, seduces the boy. And and uh, we all got uh, that junior high school, don't share your friend's eye makeup thing, pink eye. Uh -huh. Yeah, we all got pink eye from that because there was something in the water, uh, the, the and, and in the blood, the, the makeup blood that they used that, that gave us all eye infections. Didn't matter for me because I'm Freddy Krueger. You know, I don't have to look my best, but like a couple of the girls, you know, walked around looking like they'd been in a prize fight. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my oh, name is David. Yep. Hi. Over here. Uh, I was wondering, what scares Freddy Krueger? What? What scares you? What scares Freddy Krueger? Oh, what's what scares me? Well, I used to be snakes. You know, I'm I'm pretty tough. You know, about a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, the dark and claustrophobia and things like that. Heights don't get to me, but. I never liked snakes. I don't know why. When I was a little kid, I went on a vacation to my uncle's house in Florida, who I'm named after, and he had Siamese cats. And they literally, as a reward to their master, I went to get the milk. We used to be things to get milk delivered back in the old, olden times. Uh, there was a thing called the milkman. I went to get the milk in the morning. You know, I was a guest, and I opened the door, and the two Siamese cats were sitting there, and they they coiled these two dead coral snakes. Well, if a coral snake bites you, you're dead before they hit the ground. There's no nothing to save you. And they're all over Florida, or they were then. This is the 1950s. And so I got that lecture, and that put the fear of God in me about snakes. Then, and this happens when you're a horror actor, sooner or later, you do your killer snake movie, your killer alligator movie. I, hell, I've done them all. I've done them both. You get asked to do what you do, you show up because you're a genre star. And that's what you do. I've done, you know, my, my alligator movie and my snake movie and everything else. And I did a movie called Python. Now, low budget, interesting cast, Jenny McCarthy, some other interesting actors, but we had a better special effect than Anaconda because that's how quick Hollywood works. They see how somebody else does it or invents it and then they can do it even better. So we had a better snake in a movie that cost one-tenth of what anaconda and i'm playing the herpetologist you know i'm the old expert on snakes and they gave me a little albino Aww. baby python Aww. as my little sort of like sidekick like my if i was a pirate and i had a parrot on my shoulder well this was my little baby snake that i carried around with me while i pronounced all these things about the giant snake that was going to get us and i would pet it and i knew how cool this was going to look in the movie you know, doing my dialogue with this little baby python coiled around me. And I had to get used to working with it. So they gave me, listen to this one, two sweat socks, two tube socks. And they tied them underneath my linen jacket with a shoelace. And they hung under my armpits, the tube sock. And they would put the baby python in there. Because they love the moisture, the heat, and the warmth. And that's how I got used to it. And I would take it out in between takes, and I, would, and I actually kind of fell in love with this thing as a pet. And I got really good with it, and I got over my snake phobia. Now, cut two years later. Now it's the mid-late 90s, and I've stopped doing horror for a while. I'm just taking a break from horror. I'm doing Disney movies, lots of Disney movies and things. And I'm on a Disney movie, his first movie, the late Paul Walker and Dennis Hopper. And I'm in Sundance making this movie, Disney movie called Meet the Deedles. And there's a, and I'm playing one of the two redneck bad boys in it. You know, there's always the, the two comedy villains in a Disney movie, and I was one of them. And the guy working with me, terrific actor, we work with a giant bear. It's that giant bear that's in every movie. It's that famous giant bear. It goes after Alec Baldwin. It goes after Anthony Hopkins. You need a bear, this is the bear. This bear has a bigger dressing room than I have. <laughs> We're shooting, and they have to clear all the food off the set. Everybody backs away, and all of a sudden, because the bear, you want to distract the bear, all of a sudden two really cute teenage girls come riding up bareback, you know, and all the guys on the crew, <laughs> they're like dogs, you know. And they, these girls walk by, well, the horse is poop between where I'm going to act and the bear. It's a shot of me with a, with a bow, like Norman Reedus, you know, I've got, I've, and I got a crossbow, and I'm the bad guy, the goofy bad guy, and the bear's right there. I'm acting with this, this Hollywood bear. It's like nine feet tall. It's bigger than my surfboard. 
And my other, my, my buddy, the other actor, terrific actor, he, he can't do the scene. And he did something in his pants. A little, because he was scared. Just a little one. Just, you know, a little tiny wet bubble. That's as nice as I can make it sound. But the mayor noticed it. And this guy was freaked. And we had finally, finally, you know, he changed. We got to do it. We picked up the horse poop. Got all the craft service feet out of the way. The bear reared up. I pointed my bow at him and we got the shot. Now, here's why I'm telling you all this long, long part of the story. I go back to the hotel room. The other actor goes back. He lives underneath me in the hotel room. I go down to visit him, have a beer. We have a couple days off. We're waiting for Dennis Hopper to arrive. I walk into his room, and in terrariums, he's got cobras. He milks cobras. And you may get the venom, and it's like very lucrative. I said, Richard, for God's sakes, you're afraid of a bear? You've got cobras in your motel room, in Sundance? And he goes, I said, how did you get them here? He put them in tube socks. <laughs> under his arms on the plane. This is why we need TSA. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you for asking that. Thank you. Who knew, right? I'm uh, Colin from Bothell, Washington, and I'm just nice a sweater, dude. Oh, thank you very much. I was curious, out of all the seven sequels you did for the Nightmare on Elm Street series, which one would be your favorite? Oh, my favorite? Uh, you know, it changes. I'll tell you how I, how I see it now. Part one is the scariest. Part three, Dream Warriors, is the fan favorite. I like my acting in part four the best. It's my favorite. But my favorite, God bless his soul, is Wes Craven's New Nightmare, part seven. You know, now we're, we're, we're living in a post-Guardians of the Galaxy, a post-Deadpool world. But that's one of the first meta-deconstructed horror movies made for you. Wes made that movie for you guys. We make fun of ourselves, we talk about you, we talk about the relationship with the fans, we tease you guys a little bit too. Plus, we've got an earthquake, Heather Langenkamp, a kid in Jeopardy, and a movie within a movie. So it's really a smart movie. Trust me, the Blu-ray on your flat screen on a rainy day with the lights turned down, it really holds up. That idea of putting the kid in it, it's this genius thing where you invest emotionally more watching a child in jeopardy. This is the trick Guillermo del Toro does, you know? And, and he's got some great underrated movies. I don't know if you guys have seen The Devil's Backbone. Whoa. And, um, and that, how about that actor? That guy, Eduardo Noriega, is so good in that. And that's a nasty movie, but that's a great movie and beautifully shot. But then the other one uh, with the insect man, Mimic, Little Boy Witness, Kronos, Little Boy Witness. So this is this great hook, you know, that I love in horror and science fiction, the child witness, you know, invasion of the, uh, in, you know, invaders from Mars, the child witness in Jeopardy. Um, so Wes Craven's New Nightmare is my favorite. I did a movie uh, that's going to be uh, at uh, South by Southwest. I'm, I'm flying there next week. And it, this is a movie I did like, I think we're having an anniversary screening a couple of nights. And uh, the great Scott Wilson is in it from uh, Walking Dead. And he plays the retired serial killer, <laughs> flipping burgers, you know. And uh, a wonderful, wonderful iconic Zelda Rubenstein from Poltergeist. And uh, it, it, this movie is called uh, Behind the Mats. The Rise of Leslie Vernon. And it's a really interesting companion piece with Wes Craven's New Nightmare for the sort of turning point of meta movies of, of we know that you know what we know, but we're still gonna get you. Thank you, great question. You mentioned Deadpool and also Guardians Volume 1. Do you have a favorite Marvel movie in, or movie in the MCU? Well, you know, it changes because they're, you know, they're, they're coming out a lot now. But, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I think my, my favorite, I have favorite Marvel characters. Okay. As opposed to Marvel movies. And, and I, I just, I think, you know, gosh, I'm not going to divulge that. 
because, I, I, because I'm going to get in trouble with my game people. I'm going to keep that quiet. Okay. I'm going to keep my Marvel favorites quiet. Stan Lee's here. I don't want to step on any toes. That's right. You, know, you would never make friends with him. That's okay. Yeah, I'll show you backstage, baby. Okay, that sounds good. You show me your Marvel, I'll show you mine. Done. Yes, hi. Hello, I'm Jasmine from Harrisburg, Illinois. And I was wondering, when you were chosen to play Freddy in Nightmare on Elm Street, could you ever have imagined that the character you, you were to play would have become a horror film icon? No, we just wanted to finish the movie when we were doing it. We ran out of money. And I've even had some fans here at this con bring me some really rare uh, publicity kit photos in black and white. The other company was Media Home Entertainment, and they had to bail us out so we could finish the movie, and New Line had to give up their video rights. See, one of the reasons I've had such a successful career is my Nightmare on Elm Street came of age the exact same moment as in the video generation and MTV and cable. So I was on cable. You could watch me on cable, order me on cable. You could bring me home with a pizza, you know, from the video store. Uh, or you could see me DJing on MTV, talking about myself. So I was able to take advantage of that. It's just a happy accident of timing, you know. Uh, so I, I, I really, I really benefited from that. Thank you. Great question. Thanks. Hi. Hey, I'm Zach from Kent. Um, I love you as Freddy. We all love you as Freddy. Um, my question, actually, though, is about Wishmaster. I loved you in Wishmaster. You were amazing. And that's the K in K and B. Kurtzman. Yeah. And uh, I was curious if you had any interesting stories uh, from shooting Wishmaster. Well, you know, I got to work with Sam Raimi's brother, Ted Raimi, who a lot of you remember from Xena. Uh, and Ted is, Ted is like so fun, so much fun to hang out with. Um, I remember showing up on their little sound stage. Now you guys have to remember, these are special effects makeup boys that are slowly becoming real players in Hollywood. But I've known them forever. I've known them since I had to watch Oprah with a sound off so they could play White Snake real loud. <laughs> so now, I drive out to their, to their makeup studio, which they converted into a sound stage, deep in the valley. But this is at a moment of time when that part of the valley has become the porn center of the world. Uh, and it's, it's hysterical. It's, it, there's a movie about it, the one with Burt Reynolds. Oh, oh yeah, and, yeah. and Mark, Marky Mark. Yeah, yeah. Boogie Nights. Nights. Boogie Nights. That, the whole area around where we shot Wishmaster was Boogie Nights. And it smelled like Boogie Nights. Let me try. <laughs> uh, and and I, so I park my car and I'm walking and it's all the porn stuff <laughs> everywhere. You know, and they're doing their push ups and they're oiling their bodies and whatever else they do. And, uh, and so I walk through that, and then I walk in this door that I've been through many, many times to do Entertainment Tonight interviews because they have really cool props there, and I would use their, those for a background for some of my publicity things, or I'd be going there for makeup, makeup tests, or molds. So I walk in the door of this place I've been to many, many times, and now it's this giant sound stage, and I literally walked in the door. Mm. And it was all the construction was completed for that opening sequence uh, with the gin where you're in, in ancient Babylonia. And he, this was like, literally, you guys have to understand something. This is a place I'd been to, you know, 20, 30 times. And now I walked in the door and I was like in, you know, ancient times. And they had done such a great job. So I knew that we were onto something original. I think the Wishmaster. Uh, movies uh, deserved a little more respect. It's a great hook, and Andrew Devoff is terrific in those films. Uh, and you know, there's a new one. There's a new. It's not. It's not Wishmaster, but there's a new movie coming out called Wish Upon. Wish Upon. I saw the trailer the other night, and it looks terrific too. So they've taken that idea. I like. It's something that we all know. Every culture knows it. That you know, make a wish. If you could have three wishes, what would they be? And then the trick of what if you make the wrong wish, or some, or what if. The power behind the wish can turn your wish against you. And I thought it was just a great, great hook, a great gimmick for a, 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 a franchise that unfortunately didn't go far enough, I think. You know, uh, I think they should have maybe waited a little longer because I know how successful those guys are. I think there was probably at least one more to be made that would have been really interesting. Amen. Definitely. Thank you. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Katie. Um, I had a, um, I'm from Bellevue, Washington. I had a quick question about what kind of things you did to prepare mentally for the role of Freddy Krueger. You kind of addressed the physicality earlier, but I was kind of curious, like... Well, I, I found the voice looking in the mirror in hours and hours of makeup tests. And I would just yell at David Miller. David Miller just come off of a little thing called Thriller with Michael Jackson. <laughs> yeah, and Rick Baker. And uh, so David, I would, there would come a point where I'd just go, God! You know, he'd, he'd like he'd have his wet finger in my ear, like, wet willy, like, God! You know, and I'd say, ah, 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 that kind of, David Miller. Ooh, that might work. David Miller. David Miller. And I was looking at, and I'm in the makeup, looking in the mirror. And so I kind of found the voice there. But about a week into the movie, they're having a horrible hot summer. Again, we're at the Desilu Studios, the old Desilu, where they shot the Brady Bunch. There's literally Brady Bunch stuff on the wall, still peeling, you know, fan stuff from, from this big family show. There's, and they shot Dick Van Dyke there for a little bit, you know. So like, I'm trying to smell Mary Tyler Moore's perfume. And you know, and, 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 and Lucy, I love Lucy. And we're in this, it's a wonderful neighborhood in old Hollywood, and it's really hot, and I'm in the Lucy Desi, deluxe, pink, retro, 1950s diner makeup room. And I've been there since four in the morning, and I've shot like a bunch of stuff of me scratching the pipes and crap, and I'm back in my chair, and I'm getting touched up, and it's like 95 degrees out, and smoggy, and I'm getting, you know, poked, and they're basting me with KY jelly like a turkey. And in walks Johnny Depp and Heather Langenkamp, arguably the two most beautiful young people, certainly in California at that moment of time. I mean, they were like, their skin was perfect, their hair was perfect, their lips were perfect, their eyes were clear, they're gorgeous. And they sit down and they, everybody fusses over them. Makeup, oh, makeup, hair, makeup, hair, powder, makeup, hair. And I, they don't need makeup. I mean, they're gorgeous. You can't even see their pores with a magnifying glass. They're so beautiful. Johnny's got the most perfect. Johnny goes like this and his hair falls in front of him like Elvis. I mean, you know. And, and Heather, who looks like what you want Brooke Shields to look like. Brooke's beautiful. No, Brooke's beautiful, but Brooke's too tall for most of us boys to dance with. She's model size. Heather is bite size. <laughs> they're up and bite them like an apple. Anyway, they're sitting next to me. Now here's the coup de grace. Here's what finally gets to me. And this is how I find Freddie. They give Johnny Depp, the most beautiful boy in Hollywood, and Heather Langenkamp, the most beautiful girl in Hollywood, two little pink fans with batteries in them. Oh, because it's so hot out. <laughs> Wait a minute, am I chopped liver? I'm over here like a turkey getting Vaseline put all over me and somebody's poking me with a Japanese toothbrush in the nose and I, and I, and I went, oh, Robert, God, have you done the right thing? You're starring on television, you know? You're getting all this fan mail, you know? Uh, 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 it's just the right career move, you're 30 years old. Look at them, they're young, they're beautiful, they got their whole careers ahead of them. That... Wait a minute. I can use that envy. I can use that anger. What does Freddy Krueger do? He kills youth. He kills the young. What is that? It's the future he's killing. Because there's no place for Freddy Krueger in the future. And that little moment of anger and jealousy and envy of Johnny and Heather, the acting trick is, you just remember that, and I can turn that on. Boom. I could turn it right on. And then I could use that after 12 hours in the makeup, you know, on a sound stick when I have to like throw Johnny up against the wall or, you know, chase Heather around her bed and get hit with a pillow. I can find that to kind of make it real. You know, it's that you guys have all heard the story about how they direct children in the old days in Hollywood who would tell them their dog died to guys and that's the trick. It's called sense memory. And that's what happened for me. And that's how I found my way into hating the kids, or getting mad at the kids, or wanting to kill them. Really having a thought in my head. Because Freddie doesn't, Freddie, it's my eyes. When we put too many contacts in, Freddie looks like a doll. But you leave my eyes, and he comes alive. And in the eyes, 
are the windows of the soul. So if I'm really thinking, God damn, Jimmy Depp, you're going to be a big star someday. I'm going to get you. I can use that. Even if I'm just thinking that, Heather Langenham, you little slut. I'm gonna, I can use that. And it's real. You guys see it on film. You see it that I'm really mad, and that's for that second. So that's how I found my way into Freddie. Thank you. That was a great question. Very, very insightful. So interesting to know Johnny Depp inspired uh, Freddie Krueger's inner uh, angst. Yes. Hi, I'm Robin. I'm from Detroit, and I live in Seattle. And I used to. I worked in Detroit for many, many years. What part of Detroit? Um. I I, I was Oakland County. I was out in Meadowbrook Theater. Right near Rochester? Nice, nice. Yeah. Uh, no, I was over in the Greenfield area. Okay, yeah, God, that's great. I've had great times there. Great actors. Uh, so I've been a Freddy fangirl since I was super, super, super young. When I was seven, I begged my father for the action figure until he gave it to me. Um, but my question for you is, doing these questions and uh, panels, what question have you always wanted somebody to ask you? And if you don't have one, what's your favorite question that you haven't asked? Oh, I like to be asked like when we started, and, and we'll be we'll be honest. We've never met, uh, except for that night in Paris. No, <laughs> that one time. Yeah. That one no, time in Spain. Was terrific, wasn't it? That champagne. But no. <laughs> but we we plan a little, and I wanted it because I am. A, you guys, you know, all actors are fans too. You should see us in the green room telling each other our, our favorite movies and stuff with each other's, and it's real. We do. It's like it's a treat. You know. I mean. Uh, this isn't my first time with Millie Bobby Brown. I met her at another show, but I'm a huge fan of, of that show, and I was able, and I know how special she is. And uh, so, and, and I'm a legitimate fan of her. I'm a fanboy too. And so we love it when we're asked those things. Now, at the cons, a lot of you are very young, but you know, there, but it is, as the cons grow, so does the generation of fans at the con. So I can talk about, you know. I like to question about what, what, what do I like, and I can bring up old movies, or old horror movies that you should see. A movie like uh, Brian De Palma's Sisters, 1974, starring the original Lois Lane, Margot Kidder. Brilliant movie. Best mad scientist ever, William Findlay, who I worked with in uh, 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 Death Trap, which was later called uh, something else, but it, uh, another one of my alligator movies. Uh, <laughs> but it's a Toby Hooper alligator movie, so I showed up. Um, but William Finley, this great, great actor who's passed away, but was a terrific genre actor. He's in The Fury. He's in Phantom of the Paradise. Uh, he's, yeah, he's this great actor, wonderful actor. So I, I love being asked that question because I like to be able to share that. And also, new stuff. Like I, we were all talk, we were talking about the OA uh, a few minutes ago uh, and, and things like that. So I, that's. Th those are the questions I like, th about what I like, because it's a way for me to reveal to you that we're all the same, that, you know, it's that thing, and, and that actors are our fans too. Exactly, and it's so interesting, you bring up the point of, you know, we enjoy coming to conventions just as much probably as you guys do to see people that we're passionate about, you know, so. Yeah, it's, you know, it's really fun, especially if there's something new uh, on the block, like uh, every time I go to the men's room here, I walk by the poster for the lovely young lady from Outlander. <laughs> I mean, Highlander. Highlander. And uh, 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 I like Outlander too, no, but Highlander. And, uh, and it's, I mean, I saw her and it's like, be still my heart, you know, because uh, we're fans too. Absolutely. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Hi. Hello. My name is Cody Bratch. I'm from Mount Lake Terrace, Washington. First off, let me say it is a sincere honor to see you today. It'd be a sincere, sincere honor to see you any day, but I'm a big fan. I used to be really scared of Freddy Krueger when I was a kid. Even before I saw any of the movies, my foster sister would scare me with Freddy stories. And now, I'm still scared, but now I'm highly entertained too. <laughs> now, my question for you is, well, you already answered the first half of the question when you were talking about Millie Bobby Brown. We were talking about a show that she was on that you're a fan of. I'll say the show right now, Stranger Things. Have you ever been offered a chance to guest star on the show? And if not, would you take the offer if it came to you in the future? Oh, I, I mean, we'd love to be on Stranger Things. I mean, I like all the acting on that show. I love the kids and, and, the, and the wonderful actor playing the sheriff. Just and I've, seen, and I've been a fan of that guy forever, but somebody finally gave him a lot of screen time. 
No, you know, it's, it's strange when you're an actor. Um, you try to schedule stuff. What you have to understand, I mean, we're overpaid, but part of that is we can't be in two places at once. And many times it's like you can't have a bidding war. That's sort of like a rule in Hollywood, you can't have a bidding war. You have to make a choice. And so you say, you, you, you choose a part because of the role, or you choose a part because you want to work with a director, or you choose the part because you love the script, or you choose the part because they offer you a lot of money, or sometimes just to go somewhere exotic. You know, uh, I worked all over the world, and uh, it, it's one of the great gifts of being an international actor. And that's one of the great gifts of being in horror, science fiction, or fantasy work, is that that's universal that those movies are universal because they speak the international language of cinema. Everybody understands them. You could take Jimmy Fallon over to Paris or to Italy or to Spain, they don't get his humor. Uh, he's a, I love Jimmy Fallon. I'm just saying that's a cultural thing. It's a, it's a specifically kind of American, hip, lip, cool, Saturday night persona. So some things don't translate back and forth, but action movies, science fiction movies, fantasy movies and horror movies, they do, they're universal. So I had two huge hits back to back, back in 1982, three and four, science fiction and horror, which opened the whole world to me. And that's just been this great happy accident and, uh, and, and gift. And, and yeah, I'd like to do, there's a whole bunch of stuff I'd like to be on. It's not just genre stuff. But yeah, there's, there's, there's genre of directors I'd like to work with. There's a guy working now, he did a thriller a couple of years, but I don't, it's not a thriller, it's a revenge movie. It was like a Don Siegel, uh, kind of like a Charlie Varick, 70s, a, a giant, it's really hard to pin part of it. It was a movie called Blue Ruin. And then the same guy that, that stars in that is also in a movie called Green Room with Anton Yelchin. Someone else we lost, Anton Yelchin. And now he's got a new movie out with Melanie Linsky that's just terrific. So these are people that, yeah, I'd like to work with too, you know, call me. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And we are all your children now. <laughs> all right, we have time for one last question. The last question, and it better all be right, good. No the, pressure. The pressure is on, right? Hi, I'm Juliana from, Hi, Juliana. from Eden Claw, Washington. And my question was more about when you started, what movies inspired you to be an actor, or like what actors inspired you to do, take up this trade? Well, my influences are really strange, because I was like, fanboy, but with, a, with parents that took me to adult, but I don't mean adult films, I mean <laughs> grown-up films, right? So, I remember, I remember Marlon Brand, I was there, opening night, on the waterfront, Marlon Brando, in Hollywood, and I was a little kid sitting between my parents, and I remember they threw the body off the roof, and it got caught on the uh, 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 fire escapes, and they, and they, they covered the, 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 the body with newspaper. This was the brother of Eva Marie Saint, who plays the girlfriend of Marlon Brando in that movie, and it might have been Brando's fault. He invited the guy up onto the roof, to look at his pigeons. So that's like the, how the and I remember that. I was like, like this big, sitting there with my mom and dad and my hot buttered popcorn. So then I remember shortly after, so that's adult. But I, it's, it was like, I remember that movie like a grown up. Then I went to opening night, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Yeah. Disney. Cine this division, yeah. you can't see a movie in this division anymore. Oh. It's better than your best flat screen. It's like the curved flat screen or curved IMAX. And there I am, and it's James Mason, Peter Lorre, Kirk Douglas, the Nautilus, the Nautilus opening its eye and looking out under the sea at Art Nouveau. Deep sea divers burying somebody under the sea. The giant squid, the first time the giant squid's tentacle grabs a sailor, pulls him from the inside of the submarine, thrashes him around outside. Kirk Douglas throws a harpoon in him. The giant squid releases the guy. He staggers down into the bottom of the submarine and he's got giant 
sucker marks on him from the tentacle. Oh, little Robbie England pooped his pants. <laughs> this is what I want to do. This is magic. A year later, my famous cousin Phil Edgar from the early 50s television and his daughter, my cousin, invite me to opening day at Disneyland. Oh. I go to opening day at Disneyland. Oh. And there, in Fantasyland, is the Nautilus from the movie. And you can walk into it. And it's all the props you saw in the movie, and you can push a button. It's the cheap ticket. It's the A ticket back then, which is the cheap one. You know the expression, E ticket, yep. means something good? Yep. That's where it comes from, the old days of Disneyland. The A ticket was the crap ticket. This was the best thing I'd ever seen. The original props, the jacket James Mason wore, the costume Peter Lorre wore, they have the soundtrack playing. You're on the real set and it's a cutaway. And you push a button, you're allowed to stand in line, push a button, and the kaleidoscopic window, the eye of the Nautilus opens and you look out, and there, in special effects lighting, with fans blowing special effects seaweed and lighting, like surface of the ocean lining is the giant squid from the movie. And I was hooked. They're playing me off. <laughs> I haven't even my agent yet. You guys, Robert, we're almost at the end of your week of the hour. We have a minute left. But I just, I just want to thank you so much. I think it's always so insightful when it's not just about talking about your own roles, but your passions too. And I, I just think it just gives you such an interesting dynamic to know you're kind of like one of us, right guys? Thank you for spending this time. You guys, one more huge round of applause for Robert.